Section 8.2 is surfaces of um, er, surface areas of solids of revolution. So to go ahead and um, move a little bit faster through this particular proof, I typed it up and we'll just run through it and focus in on um, the actual formula, where it comes from, and how we use it in some examples. So to start off with, we're going to look at solids of revolution. So again, we're going to take a curve, y equals f of x, or uh, g equals y, x equals g of y, and we're going to rotate it around either the x-axis or the y-axis. When we do that, we'll create a solid of revolution, like just like we looked at with volumes, and um, we're going to consider what would be the actual surface area. Instead of looking at the volumes now, what would be the surface area of that solid of revolution? Now, to be specific, when we talk about surface area, we are only going to be talking about the lateral boundary, which means just the... Um, just the surface area excluding, not including, the actual end pieces of this solid. So we're looking just at the lateral boundary here. Okay, so to do that, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to split it up into little, little bands of surface area. And then we're going to compute the surface area of each of those bands, add up all of those surface areas for the total surface area. Um, and then to get more accurate, just let the band width, the actual width of the band, go to zero. Let the number of these divisions increase without bound with a limit, and that's going to turn into an integral. So just two quick formulas um, that we're going to see as we move through here is the surface area of a cylinder. Again, the lateral surface area of a cylinder, so just the, um, just the band part, not the top and the bottom. So given a right circular cylinder with radius r and height h, the surface area is 2 pi r, the circumference actually, if you were to cut that, uh, times the height. Okay. So that's our surface area of the cylinder and the surface area of a cone. So if we were to actually take a cone, a right circular cone with a radius of r and a slant height of l, and if we were to cut that right up the side there and open it up, we would get a shape that looks like this, that we would that we could compute the a wedge, actually a wedge shape, um, and we could compute the surface area or the area of that shape to give us the surface area of the cone. And it turns out, um, just using some definition of radian measure and thinking about what percent of the, the larger circle theta is there, we find that the actual surface area of a cone, and these are just some little geometric formulas, um, the surface area of the cone is pi times uh, the radius of that cone times its slant height. Okay. All right, so those are the two formulas we're going to utilize through this proof just out of geometry, and let's go ahead, jump in, apply those formulas to our actual function that we rotated to create the solid of revolution. So now we're ready to actually consider these solids of revolution. I took these images out of... Um, out of the book so that we could sort of look at these images. And so let's see if I zoom in a little bit there. If we're looking at this solid, y equals f of x, and we want to find the surface area, the way we'll actually create the surface area is by looking at individual bands of surface area and then sort of adding them all up. So if you can see on this particular picture here, if we were to cut up a to b, into n little subintervals, and on each subinterval create a band of surface area, it would look something like that. Okay, so we'll take essentially what we're going to take is a line segment and we're going to rotate it around. So we take a line line segment, rotated around the axis of revolution. and that creates this band of surface area that we're going to be looking at. Okay. Once we figure out how to write up each of these bands, we can then add them all up and then let the actual width of those bands uh, go to zero with a, with a limit. Okay, so let's move on, take a look. Um, if you think back to that band again, so I know I just zoomed out again, but if you think of that band, and actually just for, for our purposes so that we can see where this formula comes from using right triangles, if I were to take that band and I were to put it on the table, what I'd get is the bottom part of a cone. So we think of it, we actually think of each of those bands as a portion of a cone. So we're going to end up having, so we've just taken that band here, 
right here is that band of surface area. And it's the bottom half of a cone. Um, the larger cone has a radius R2 and the top cone there has a radius of R1. Um, the actual length of the band right here is L and then the the length, the, later, the lateral length right there, the slant height, is L1 of the top cone, although the top cone doesn't actually exist, that's why it's in dashes, but we need it there so that we can talk about that uh, surface area of a cone. And then it turns out if we wanted just the surface area of the band, let's see here, I can zoom in just a little bit. So if we wanted just the surface area of the band right here, what we would do is we would take the larger cone, the surface area of the larger cone, and subtract the surface area of the smaller cone. And so just using our area of a cone that we um, looked at above, uh, that I referenced above, uh, the area of a cone is pi times, this is cone, the area of a cone is pi times r times l. And so utilizing that formula, uh, for the two cones here, area of the large cone minus, and when I say area, I am referencing surface area, area of the large cone minus area of the small cone, um, just utilizing some similar triangles. Over here, this was the, the similar, similar triangles give us this relationship. So utilizing some similar triangles and just a little bit of algebra here, uh, take the area of the large cone minus the area of the small cone, expand it out, and then actually doing a little bit of work right here and dividing by two and multiplying by two. And the whole reason we wanna do that right here in this last step, um, I'm gonna skip over some of the algebra there, you can look through that, but doing the distribution and simplification there. Um, the reason right here in this last step that I do this is because this now becomes the average, what we can think of as the average radii of the band. And that's gonna help us when we set up the Riemann sum to compute this surface area, okay? So that's the average radii of the band. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom back out again now that we've got that algebra piece, whoops. Done. I'm going to get down here, get this a little bit more focused there. Okay, and this is what we've ended up coming up with that the area of each band in that surface of revolution is 2 pi r l, where r equals r2 plus r1 over 2. Again, that's the average radii of the band. So, I'm going to keeping that in mind, that's the average radii of the band, and L is the actual length of the line segment. Now, this whole idea of this length of the line segment, we just finished the section on arc length, so I'm just going to write arc length right here, explanation mark, because that's going to be useful for us too. So now that we've set up, um, we've set this up, we figured out what the area of the band is, 2 pi times the average radius times the length of a line segment. Um, We'll reference back to arc length here in a second. So we're kind of pulling a few different things together here, some geometric formulas plus uh, what we did in 8.1. All right, so um, this part I am gonna run through pretty quickly, but we're looking at now going back to the actual surface of revolution. We are, for our proof, we're gonna look at um, a curve y equals f of x. The same proof though, uh, by the way, could be done for x equals g of y um, and doing it for delta y rather than delta x. But uh, we'll, we'll run through the proof. It would look very similar, just um, the variables would be around um, the y-axis. We'd be looking on the y-axis. So we're gonna take y equals f of x, we're gonna break it up into little line segments, just like we did when we calculated arc length, uh, p sub i minus one, p sub i, um, on that interval from a to b, that comes from being divided into n subintervals, where delta x is uh, b minus a over n, and we've got all our n points, and we look at those two points, p sub i minus one, p sub i, we can see it on the picture here, this band again. And when we rotate that around, we get a band that has a slant height, so L is the actual slant height of the band. And that happens to be equal to the line segment P sub I minus one, P sub I. And R equals the average radii. 
Now, interestingly enough, that, that average radii, because now we've defined uh, the actual curve, y equals f of x. So that radii is actually just whatever the y values are of, of the actual values of the function at each of those points. So it's just one half. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the radii, not the average radii. We're going to come back to that in just a second. The actual radius of, so the radii, um, one half y sub i minus y sub i minus one. Okay. Radii. Radius. Well, you know what? I just noticed in my... I just noticed real quick, guys, in my actual type up here, this should have been a plus. I did catch it down below, but let's come back up, um, back up here on my notes right here. This should, this should actually have been a plus when I typed it up. Um, and I did catch that down here. I typed it up correctly. So the, the value of the band, actually, that we should be adding those two y's up to get that average radius. Okay. So y sub i plus y sub i minus one. Okay, sorry about that little little typo right there, but that happens when uh, you're typing these things up quickly in the middle of the night. So um, let's remember from the last section what that actual length of that line segment is, because the slant height, this is going back to our arc length. We looked at that, that exact line segment, those exact line segments back in 8.1, and we've already gone through that whole bit. And so the length of each of those line segments using that, remember we had that kind of fun little, fun little proof where we were able to show using the mean value theorem that p sub i, p sub i minus one is equal to the square root of one plus f prime of some tag on that subinterval squared um, delta x. Okay? So once that happens, we know that we can plug that back into the area of the band, and we want to look at just one more little piece, and that has to do with the fact that as delta x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, basically the two y values end up getting smushed together. So basically y sub i is essentially the same as y sub i minus 1 as delta x goes to zero. So is that length of that subinterval, if you can see me kind of smushing my fingers together, as the length of that subinterval that we're looking at, the, the two values on the x-axis get closer and closer and closer, well then what that means is that the y sub, out, y sub i and y sub i minus one values get closer and closer and closer together. So putting all that together, what we end up with, and so this is, this is that approximation basically since those two values are basically the same. Okay. We can say that uh, y sub i is basically f of x sub i star and y sub i minus 1 is the same as f of x sub i star. We can add those together. We have the 1 half and put in our arc length and this ends up being all of that, putting all that together. All that, lots of, actually quite a bit of geometry there. Putting all that together, we end up finding, we get an approximation for the band using a tag on the subinterval that is 2 pi f of x sub i star times the actual arc length um, from our arc length formula, line segment formula, square root of 1 plus f prime of x sub i star squared. So we put that all together, throw a limit on it, and we end up with our surface area formula, the surface of a solid of revolution. So the surface area of a solid found by rotating the function y equals f of x, where y equals f of x is positive and has a continuous derivative. We do have to be a little bit careful on this part um, based on how we found this. From um, the, on the interval from a to b ends up being 2 pi f of x times the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. Okay? Or we could use Leibniz notation. So these are the two formulas if we've rotated about, this is for a rotation about the x-axis. I mentioned um, at the beginning of our description of the proof that we could actually have rotated around the y-axis. We could have taken a function of y and rotated around the y-axis, and we would have gotten a very, very similar proof. It would have looked, 
um, or would have generated this formula. So the surface area of a solid found by rotating the function x equals g of y, where x equals g of y again is a positive is a positive function and has a continuous derivative. Um, on the x-axis defined from c, I'm sorry, on the y-axis defined from c to d, then we end up with a surface area um, integral from c to d of 2 pi g of y times the square root of 1 plus g prime of y squared. Uh, and of course, this time we're integrating with respect to y. And you can see the Leibniz notation down here too. 2 pi x times the square root of 1 plus dx dy squared dy. So this is when we rotate. This is for a rotation about the y-axis. Okay, and you can see a little picture here. This is actually, if you were to take the parabola y equals x squared um, from 1 to 4 on the y-axis and rotate just that little segment all the way around the y-axis, that would generate that uh, particular image. Okay. So, just one last thing before we um, close out this surface area um, proof and formulas. There is this little shorthand notation. We, had, we saw this at the end of 8.1. So we saw this with the differentials. So from 8.1, we talked about how with the relationship of the differentials, we end up with ds squared equals dy squared plus dx squared. And this is kind of convenient because manipulated um, in either way, you can show that this ends up being so from 8.1, you can show that ds is equal to either the square root of 1 plus dy dx quantity squared dx, or you can show that ds is equal to the square root of 1 plus dx dy squared dy. So using that little shorthand notation, ds ends up being our actual arc length. We get that little arc length there. And so approximating our, um, what those, those come out of approximating our arc length. So <clears throat> from 8.1. So if we think of that, that ends up giving us a little bit of shorthand notation. So if we're thinking about, okay, we're going to take a, we're going to take a function, we're going to rotate it around the x-axis. Um, so it's going to have a visual like we have here. The surface area, just jumping back up to the earlier formula, but the surface area is just the integral from a to b of 2 pi times y. y ends up actually being the radius of each of our little bands that we're going around. So y times ds, ds being the actual little line segment that we have in there that we've rotated around. It's a line segment of infinitely small width is what you want to think about there. And again, if you think about what that looks like, 2 pi y, that's actually the circumference of the band, and ds is the width of the band. The width in this case being the actual width right here, that little, think of that as that infinitely small little line segment got rotated around to create that. So that gives us a sh kind of a shorthand way to remember the actual surface area formula. And then if you have this, remembering that this is the case up here, you can remember that that width, that ds, is actually going to always be represented as one of these two. Okay? So this will come into play a little bit when we get into some examples. I like to use this formula. It's uh, easier for me to remember this formula and then just reference back to. Oh, I did write that down there. I put those ds's down there. And then in a very similar way, if we rotate around the y-axis, um, we get the integral from c to d of 2 pi. In this case, the radius of each of those little bands is going to be x. And then we're thinking of taking a little width and, again, taking a little line segment, and we're rotating it around to create that band. And so we end up with, again, the circumference of that band times the width. So we've got circumference times width, and that ds uh, gives us that width. So those, those two formulas can be... Um, Useful, useful when we get into the example. So I'll reference those formulas when we do the examples. All right, so that is our proof, and those are our two formulas for the surface areas. And now our next videos will be a couple of examples of comp computing, some computation of actual surface areas.